Hello everybody! I thought what I'd do today is something I've never actually done in all these years. I mean, I've spoke about Ford one day on Mark IVs, Mark III's and Mark V's, about this and that that goes wrong with them, but I've never actually walked around a car and said what we do on a service. I mean, I know I've done like oil changes and fuel filter changes, but what I figured I'd do today, I'll just walk around the car and I'll kind of show you what I do on a, just a basic service. So, uh, what more is there to say? To say, should I say, we'll start off in the driver's seat. I guess one thing to understand here is when you're servicing a car, is if you have a routine, a point of where you start and a point where you finish, it kind of helps so that you don't miss stuff. It's the same as doing MOT tests. You'll start at a certain position, you'll work your way around in a certain route, that way you'll kind of see what you need to see without keep backtracking on yourself. Anyway, what I normally do on these taxis, first off, first off, check your seat. Make sure the material isn't ripped, stuff like that. Check your seat belt, especially for fraying. Like, look at this one, it's like it's, it's fraying. A slight bit of fraying, you can use a lighter just to burn it off or a very sharp knife. But you want to pull your seat belt all the way out give it a good check and then you want to plug it in and then you want to sort of like pull it really hard while you push that in and make sure it releases but you will go round and check all your seat belts like that but before I actually do that I'm going to get into the driver's seat stick the ignition on I can work my foot brake pedals and clutch pedals to make sure they feel okay and also make sure your brake pedal rubber's fitted they can fall off and deteriorate, same with the clutch one. I can start the engine up. Check your horn. Check your windscreen washers. We'll come to the wipers in a minute. Make sure your sun visors come down and actually flip back up properly. Check your stop starts working. Check your handbrakes working. I'll switch that back off. You're giving a, like a, a visual examination of the dash, checking your steer, you get hold of your steering wheel from top and bottom and, and give it a good wriggle and a pull, make sure it's not loose. If the steering wheel was loose, you'd certainly know about it. From this position, you can sort of like check your grab handles, make sure they're not falling off. Check your windscreen, make sure there's no cracks or chips that are gonna be in the way of, of your vision. I would check the central locking works. I would check that the windows go up and down properly. Check your uh, child locks are working on this switch here. Check your mirrors are working. And also now, at this point, we can start checking our lights. Now, I don't have a beam setter here to check them properly, so I'm using a, the, the, slide, the, the shutter door on the garage. <laughs> but if you kind of know where they're supposed to be, like if your headlights were, my, were massively out, you'd know about it. You'd see one was, was out. But I can see that these are both even, so uh, we can pretty much say they're probably not far out. Obviously I'd have to go to an MOT garage to check them properly. But we can check our main beam on our dash, we can check our indicators. And we can also turn the steering wheel, make sure they self-cancel. Check our hazard lights. And also make sure our rear fog light is working. That one will come on the dash. Once I have all the lights going, I'll then work my way round to this door, the driver's rear. I will make sure the window goes up and down. With the window down, I will make sure that I can un unlock and open the door from the inner handle and the outer handle. I will check that the, all the rear seat belts are good and they all plug in and release properly. Make sure your seats will actually come down like that pop that back into position. Once again, check all your grab handles are not falling off. Check all your upholstery, check your carpets, check your floor mats, check your seals for any kind of damage, make sure these striker pins aren't loose. And also make sure your latches are tight. You can go around and use lubricant on your latches if you wanted to. We don't tend to do that too much on the taxis because we don't want oil sort of like getting down here and on here. 
with people getting in and out of these cars with like ball gowns on and God knows what, we don't want grease getting on their clothes. You're walking around the top half of the car looking for any damage as well. Any pieces of trim that might be out of place. Check the rear wiper blade. You can now check all your lights. You'll see that the fog lights are working, side lights. We have a number plate light out here. That one's working, this side isn't working. So I'll have to change this bulb. Obviously make sure our taxi plate and number plate are on securely. Inside the boot, obviously parcel shelf that the straps aren't broken or the poppers aren't broken where they fix on. Check you've got a spare wheel that's actually pumped up with plenty of air and check your tool kits in there as well. That's a that. Come round to our filler. These are like easy fuel, easy fillers to make sure there's nothing going on in there that shouldn't be. Passenger rear door, the same as the driver's rear door. Check everything's working, check your windows go up and down. Check your seat belts, your grab handles, your seals. You can see things like this, where the seal is split. I mean, you can note all this down. If this was a customer's car, you'd probably have to note all this down. Anything you find that's not right. Passenger front door, make sure electric window switch is working. Obviously make sure the door opens from the inner door handle, which it does. Check your seats are secure, seat belts. And in here, down the bottom, we can pull our bonnet up like that with our bonnet release handle. And these bonnet handles do break, so this one's okay. Make sure your actual door mirrors are secure, the glass isn't all floppy, and that the wing repeaters are working. If they get cracked and dampness gets in there, it will destroy the LEDs. Check your wiper blades. These can get split right here in the middle, and then they don't clear very well at all, so this is a good chance to check them. Obviously, once again, have another look, good look at the windscreen. Work your way round to the front, checking that your headlights are working. You'll see in here there should be a side light bulb in here that's not working. So that's a side light bulb we've got to change as well as another plate bulb. In actual fact, both the side lights aren't working. <laughs> so I've got both. I've got two side light bulbs and one number plate. One number plate bulb to change. Also, on these particular cars. If I switch the headlights off, we now have our daytime running lights on. So we want to make sure that both of them bulbs are working. That is pretty much my walk around the top half of, the, of these cars before I actually start a service, just going through the lights. Obviously at the back, which I didn't mention, if you get somebody to Put their foot on the brake so you can check the stop lights and check the reverse lights however you can switch the engine off and put it into reverse and you can put a lever bar between the seat and the brake pedal to actually get your stop lights to work if you've got an assistant but that's it that's that's my general walk around the top half of the car and from this point i'm going to turn the car around and i'm going to put it back on the ramp the other way and then we're going to go underneath but we'll do it under the bonnet first right oh Let's have a look underneath the bonnet. I will start over here. If you suspect you're going to change any brake pads, you want to remove this cap and make sure the fluid level isn't too high. If it was too high, you'd have to drain a bit out because otherwise what will happen is, as you push the pistons back in the calipers, this will overflow and spill all over the floor. So, and also with a cap on it could squirt out and get onto your paintwork. So always take the cap off. Right, I'll work my way around. We have no coolant in the expansion bottle. I actually know what's leaking. I'll show you in a bit. So uh, we'll come back to that. I will top the washer bottle up, which I've done 
with water and screen wash. Fuel filter, I generally replace the fuel filter around about every 15 to 20,000 miles. I do, they're a small filter, they tend to get blocked quite quick, so it's just worth doing them. I will remove the oil filler cap and pull the dipstick out. I don't know why I say it, I just like to let gravity into the engine when I drop the oil out. Not so much on these engines, but when you have a sump, on the, a sump bung on the side of a sump and you take it out and the cap was still on, the oil can like splurge out <laughs> and go all over the place. You can, you can miss the bucket quite easily. Anyway, let me just grab a torch. <clears throat> Check down there for your alternator belt. If it's not cam belt replacement time on one of these engines, then you haven't got to worry too much. But with the engine running, make sure that alternator belt is not flapping all over the place. If it's flapping about too much, or well, if it is it's flapping about, then the overrunning alternator pulley would be what will be locked up, which means you're gonna need a new put pulley on your alternator or replace the alternator. So anyway, <coughs> we're ready to change the engine oil. The fuel filter we, we would replace. Check your turbo hoses are okay, because they can get split. And once again, what I've just said about that alternator belt flapping around, sometimes they can hit the lower turbo hose and cut a hole in it. Then you will have problems, because if the engine gets choked up, the exhaust will get choked up then, and you'll end up having to do a, a static regen on your car. Right, we'll work our way around. You're basically just looking for anything you can see. Usually in this area where you've got your EGR valve and your, especially your thermostat housing, check for leaks. And as far as the thermostat housing goes, and on the ribs in the gearbox, you'll see coolant sitting there. There's a little bit from a while back. I think this thermostat housing has been changed a while back. It's not leaking, so we're okay. You would replace this air filter if needed. Check your headlights are all secure because sometimes they can get damaged and the brackets can get broke. Check your battery and also check your battery terminals. Make sure the terminals aren't loose. It does happen quite a lot and make sure your battery's clamped down. Uh, check anything you can see. Brake servo hose is all in place. Make sure there is no diesel leaking from around your injector areas where your leak off pipes or anything like that go on it. If the diesel was leaking, you would smell it anyway. And one other little thing here, where you've got your fuel pipes that run above your fuel temperature sensor, make sure that pipe isn't touching. This sensor's got two clamps on it. Uh, this second clamp was a modification, but sometimes this bracket can get bent downwards and that pipe can hit that uh, little spring clip there and rub through and, all, and then start leaking. We've had a few like that. So uh, just be warned. The little bleed off pipes that go on your thermostat housing also, they get very brittle. Just make sure they're, they're okay and not about to break. But that's it, there isn't a great deal to look at underneath the bonnet. Really, it's, it's your oil and filter, fuel filter and air filter. That's about it, and the rest of it is having a good visual examination. Now the vehicle's raised up, the first thing I do before I go underneath it is just to walk around, to see the bottom half of it, to see everything's okay. And one thing to note here, Behind your front bumper, you've got your grill shutter mechanism. You want to make sure them slats aren't bust or out of place because they can cause problems. Usually, if the slat that goes onto the motor is damaged or out of place, your cooling fans will come on full blast all the time. So, I'm just going to walk around and make sure things like lower bumper skirt trims aren't falling off and stuff like that. These panels aren't damaged. There's no dents in the doors. Anything that don't look out of place, you want to note it down, especially if it's a customer's car. So I'll keep going around. Everything on this car looks pretty much okay. You've got a bit of rear bumper there sticking out. So that's gonna need fixing back into place. Anyway, once we've walked around like that, I'm going to come underneath and come to the driver's front. 
Now, I have already move, removed the lower engine tray here. There's about 11 Torx 30 screws. So I've taken that panel out of the way. Simple reason is, at this point, we're gonna change the oil and filter. Now, I've, on this car, I've already drained the oil, which is, you pull that pin out there and then drain it through that plug. And I've replaced the oil filter as well. So on these oil filters, by the way, when you put a new filter on, make sure they're done up really tight because these filters do tend to come loose. Anyhow, I'll get back to the suspension. Things like track ends, get your hand on them, give them a good old pull up and down. The same with your anti-roll bar. Pull the anti-roll bar up and down to make sure there's no play in here. Have a good check of the nuts and bolts, the bushes, the dust covers. Make sure everything looks like it's in place. Your rear lower suspension arm bushes, you can put a lever in there and just check there's not too much play in the, them bushes. They generally tend to last very well. Uh, where your water pump would be at the back here, have a look for any coolant leaks there because these water pumps do tend to leak. And I'm gonna work my way around. As I get to the radiator, have a good look up there where your fans are. Look where the radiator core meets the end casing. These radiators do have a tendency to leak. So you could see the, the pink coolant running down from there, or building up, crystal, crystallizing. And obviously look for any water leaks that are on your lower radiator tray here. And also make sure this tray isn't damaged because these trays do tend to get bottom out sometimes and they can get broken. So you'll keep walking around. Also while, you're, while looking at the engine as well. And surprise, surprise, we have a coolant leak here. <laughs> that is actually been leaking for a while. That is, that is your engine EGR valve that's leaking. Now I already know about this valve, but it's, it's running from higher up where the EGR valve is. And your oil filter would normally be covered in coolant as well. So I'm gonna put a new EGR valve on this engine after I've walked around this. So, but that's kind of like the mess it makes. That's been, <laughs> that has been leaking for a little while. Anyway, I shall carry on walking around. You will check the same suspension this side. And also, as we come to the gearbox, you've got your level bung up the side there by where the drive shaft is. You would pull the level bung out and you would, if nothing comes out, you can put, add a bit more oil into it. And once it runs out the level bung, then it's, at the, then it's at the correct level. So normally I would just top the gearbox oil up. The only time I actually change the gearbox oil in these cars is when I do a clutch. Anyway, I'll carry on walking around. One thing to remember here as well, when you've removed this lower engine tray that fits here, these panels here will be floppy like that. So when you go for a road test after you've done your service, you either A, want to put the lower engine tray back on, or at least put some screws in here to fix these back up. Otherwise you'll go down the road, the wind will catch these, and they'll pull down and hit the road, and you'll wonder what the hell's going on. Right, we'll carry on. So this basically it's just a visual examination. There isn't actually much to do under here, the oil and filter is the main thing. So I'll drain the oil anyway, because I mean you've got your pin there you pull out and undo, drain your oil through that sunbung, you just twist it 90 degrees. And I've changed the filter. So now you, I've worked my way back round to the driver's front where we started. And now I'm gonna work my way down the driver's side underneath, checking for anything I can see. The only thing you're really gonna see on these is these plus, well, these panels that are gonna be damaged, if, in, if at all. So uh, normally there isn't a great deal to look at. When you get to the back, you just wanna have a look at your brake pipes, brake hoses, anything you can see. Your rear shock absorber, or lower bush, make sure that bush isn't knocked out. They generally tend to last very well anyway. When you get to these rear anti-roll bar drop links, I don't have a problem with these. I don't think I've ever changed one but you can get your hand on there, give them a good pull. When you're checking ball joints like these, it's advisable to check it with the weight on the car. When they're jacked up, it's hard to get play in them. 
That's why when the wheels are actually still on the deck, you can get hold of these. And if there is any play in it, you can rock your hand like that and you'll feel it. The inner D bushes, you can, you can bang your palm of your hand on there like that and you'll feel any play. This one's actually really good. I think these bushes have been replaced at some point. Uh, the rear springs, never had a problem with them. They do well. These bushes here, they, these are the ones that cause a lot of squeaking noise. So, uh, <laughs> and you have to buy a complete new arm. But if I pull the suspension up and down, I can't hear no squeaking. So uh, I'm glad these ones are okay. Check your exhaust, check your exhaust mountings. And then you just work your way back down the passenger side of the car. Also checking your fuel straps. I mean, I know cars have fuel straps where they can corrode and break, but I've never had it on these cars. Check your fuel filler pipe. There's no damage to there. Any wiring's all in place. Everything's connected up properly. Anything you can see, basically. There isn't a whole lot to look at on these cars, to be honest with you. If I come back down to the front, uh, just check the wiring that goes on your temperature sensor on the back of your exhaust. And it's all rooted okay. Make sure it's all bolted up. Uh, obviously check for oil leaks. This one's, it's about average. Although I can't see anything dripping, so that's a good sign. That's, pro that's basically about it under here. There's nothing else to change. You would go around and check your tyre pressures. I put 36 pounds per square inch in the front and the rear. So just saying, that's, that's what we do them at. And that's it underneath. With the back wheels raised up, notice I've, I jack them up on the bottom suspension arms. It's just this particular type of ramp, although you can jack these up on the seals. Anyway, the rear springs, you'll you, you just basically go over looking around anything you can see. I will point out, I've never had a broken spring on one of these at the back, nor on the front, come to think of it. The anti-roll bar drop links, I've already uh, covered them they don't tend to get knocked out either. Uh, these D bushes on the inner part of the roll bar, yeah, you can get a little bit of play in them. You can change them if you want. But anyway, with the wheels jacked up at the back, it's just a, it's just a case of <laughs> turning the wheel around, checking the inner rim, checking the tire, checking the tread. And you'll do that both sides, obviously. That's why we're underneath the vehicle. Now I'm gonna bring the ramp down and just check the bloody wheels for actual play in them, in the wheel bearings. Keep an eye on the wheel nuts. These kind of get ballooned, these little chrome caps, and they can come off and fall off. So you wanna make sure your wheel nuts are good and that your socket fits them properly, especially the wheel brace in your boot. Because if they get ballooned, you're gonna have a trouble getting your bloody wheel brace on there, and you could get stuck. Uh, have a look through the, through the wheel at the brake disc, make sure it's not seriously worn. Look at the brake pads, if you can see them. Generally speaking, on these wheels, you can see them. So with a trusty old lever bar, you get the lever between the ramp and the wheel, and you can kind of lift the wheel up and down like that. That will probably tell you if there's any play in the top shock absorber mount, or there's any play in, the, in any of the joints in the wheel. But also, you've got to get your hands like 12 and 6 o'clock position and rock the wheel. Try and pull it for in and out as well. And then 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock and rock the wheel like that. You've, you've really got to sort of like give it some, but normally if there's any play in any of the joints or the bushes, rocking the wheel like that, you'll hear a doot, 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 if there's anything, you know what I mean? <laughs> then you've got to spin the wheel and make sure you can't hear any wheel bearing noise. Generally speaking, if you know what you're listing for, then, well, obviously, if you don't know what you're listing for, I don't know what to tell you. But if, if a wheel bearing is rough and noisy, Generally speaking, it will feel rough when you turn the wheel and you'll hear a noise that don't sound quite right. This one's actually okay. There is one other thing I'm going to point out here. On these taxis, 
generally speaking, if the rear pads are okay, we would leave the wheels on, but on a normal service, probably at a normal garage, you would remove the wheels anyway, especially alley wheels. The reason being, just in here, they can get furred up and the wheels, the alley wheels can get stuck to your hub, which is just here. No such chance on these cars because we clean all these up with a wire brush and we put some copper grease here. So the wheels are, <laughs> because there's nothing worse than undoing your wheel nuts and finding out you can't get your bloody wheel off. They can, uh, believe me, they can really get stuck. In actual fact, on, on second looking at these rear pads as well, I think I will change them, they're a bit too low. So I don't really trust them to last up to the next service. So I'm gonna change these pads. Actually, while I'm still on the subject of the rear brakes, the pads, they're like, they're about a third left. You know, when you get new pads from Ford, they don't, they, I'm sure they've made them thinner. <laughs> I really am sure they've made them thinner. If I compare, like, a brand new pad there to the old pad, it's like, the new pad really hasn't got much meat on it, if you know what I mean. But anyway, I, I don't really trust these to last the next time, so I'm going to change them anyway. I'm going to change the discs as well. The reason for that is they're a little bit worn, a bit more than I would like. They've got a bit of a ridge on them. So, uh, one thing to note here, when you're changing these rear discs, you don't have to take the, the carrier off. If you get a hammer, because the disc will be stuck to the bloody hub, no doubt, which it is. But if I get my hammer, You basically pull the disc from this side and it will come out. There you go, that's off. Bingo. And that's, that's, uh, yeah, they, they were worth changing anyway. But I'm just trying to point out here, there's no point undoing this carrier. And what you can do now, you get a wire brush and give it a clean up in here and here, then put your new disc on. One last thing before I shut up about these rear brakes, your sliding pins here. Give them a clean up on the wire wheel because rubber will get stuck to these actual sliding bits. And if, if, if rubber's stuck on it, they can, they can actually make your brake bind a little bit if you're not careful. So make sure they're nice and clean, then you can pop them back in. And just in case you didn't know, but you should know, when you change rear brakes in one of these Mark V Mondeos, you have to put the rear brake calipers into what's called maintenance mode. If you don't do that, you could have all sorts of problems. So <laughs> make sure you're able to do that. You can do it with the foot pedal and the handbrake switch, but it doesn't always work. So it's best to use an actual scan tool to actually electronically put these into maintenance mode. Anyway, that's all done. Rear pads are on, rear discs are on. They're nice. Good, nice and free spinning now. The rear discs, I mean, you know, I, I guess they could have lasted another set of pads, but they are getting a bit thin. And I mean, it's not just, not worth skimping out too much with the rear brakes or, or any brakes come to think of it. So I'm actually glad I shut them in. Hold on, what's this? Oh, it's bright out here. Good morning, Molly. Hello. You ready to start work? No. Nah. Oh, I like your Dr. Martins. Hang. <laughs> I suppose you want your tyre pressures checked? Yes, please. Right, righto. <laughs> we'll come to see you later. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> right. Okay, anyway, as I was saying, it's got a bit dark. That's the rear brakes done. I'm gonna put the wheels back on. I'm now gonna jack the front up and go over the few checks that I do there. Now I've just jacked the front wheels up and on this particular four poster ramp that I'm using, I would generally speak and check the inner wheel rims and the inner sidewall of the tires. But one important thing I do check on these cars is these drive shafts because they tend to get knocked out on the inner joints. So I would get my hand on that drive shaft like that and I would wriggle it up and down 
like that. And then I will turn the wheel round just a little bit and wriggle it again and keep doing that because sometimes you won't get the play. If, if the inner CV joint is worn out, this joint in here, if that one's worn out, sometimes if the wheel's sit in a different position, it might, you might not feel the play in it. So you've got to turn the drive shaft round to actually get the movement in it. This one's actually okay, but normally if, if they were worn out, that'd be donk, 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 donk. Bloody horrible, and you'd get a lot of vibration when you're accelerating. Obviously, just a good check around of everything. Make sure all the nuts and bolts are in place, the brake calipers and stuff. Check your brake hoses, anything you can see. You would get your lever bar once again underneath the bottom of the wheel, like that, and lever it up and down. And you'd be looking at the bottom ball joint to see if there's any play there when you're leaving the wheel up and down. Because this is a McPherson strut, usually you'd get the play if you put the lever bar in between the bottom arm and the hub like that and then you can lever the bar. Sometimes you can lever it very softly or very hard depending what type of car it is and you might get some play in that ball joint but there's no play in this one, we're all, we're all right. Uh, that's probably about it under here. Now I'll drop the ramp down and we'll do our checks at waist level. Lever your wheel up and down with your lever bar once again. Then get your wheel at 6 and 12 o'clock position and give it a good rock. Then you can get 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock and rock it again. And then turn your wheel right out like that. And you want to get the wheel, hold it at 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock and give it a good rock like that. Sometimes if the bottom ball joint's worn out and you rock the wheel like that, the ball joint will be tipping like that and you'll feel it, you'll feel the play in it. This one's actually okay. But yeah, everything's all right in suspension wise. You can sort of like check your tyres, check your inner CV boots. Just have a good look inside there with a torch for anything you can see that could be out of place or chafing or anything like that, especially brake hoses that could be out of place and chafing. And then turn your wheel right the way around the other way and rock your wheel again, three o'clock and nine o'clock to make sure there's no play in anything. Check your steering rack gaiters, your, your ball joints, your, your, your little dust covers on all your ball joints or any wiring, ABS wiring that might be out of place. And don't forget your coil spring. Have a good look up there. Some cars, it's really hard to look at the top of the coil spring, but you have to do the best you can, really. Make sure your coil spring's not broken anyway. And lastly, spin your wheels to listen for any wheel bearing noise. If you did suspect a wheel bearing, you can put one hand on one of the coil springs and then spin the wheel. Usually, if the wheel bearing is worn out and rough, you will feel the vibration through your hand on the coil spring as you spin the wheel. That's it. Service is over. It would generally take around about one hour to service one of these cars. That is a basic service, by the way. That doesn't include cam belt change. That would probably take you another hour and a half. <laughs> but no, they're quite a straightforward car to do. There isn't really much to them. And there's not much goes wrong with them suspension wise either. To say the worst, the worst problems on these cars, as I've found, is the flipping coolant leaks like the EGR valve. I've had to put a new EGR valve on this car and no doubt in a few weeks time I'll be changing the bloody thermostat housing on it. Compared to a Mark IV Mondeo, mm, these cars do suffer from a lot of coolant leaks, I must say. But anyway, the whole purpose of this video today was just to sort of like show you my routine walking around the car and how I would go about doing just a basic service. Oil and filter, I do use, well in actual fact, the 030 engine oil we use is from Ford Motor Company. So we use the genuine Ford parts supplied by Ford for these cars. Filters, brakes, anything, I get it all from Ford. I do like to use the genuine parts. I know they're a bit more expensive, but they do tend to be better quality and that's what we like here. And as they're taxes, we need them to be right, no matter what the mileage is. I mean, this car here is like 366,000 miles on the clock and it's not doing bad, to be honest with you. It still runs quite nice. No doubt it's had a chain gone and been done in the past. I'd have to look through the records to actually check that, but I'm, uh, I'm imagining it has been done. But yeah. I just wanted to show just my basic walk routine, walking around the car, how I would go about doing just the basic service. And as you can see, there really isn't much to it. So anyway, that's about it. 
So uh, thanks for watching everybody. And I guess I'll see you all in the next one. Adios. Oh shit, Monica's tire pressures. <laughs> right, there we go. <laughs> I've done my job for today. I better go and give Monica her keys back. Flippy dick, that's a bunch of keys, isn't it? Anyway. <clears throat> Where is the old girl? Hello, Bonnie. Where are you? Aha! There you go. <laughs> what are you up to? A very exciting job. Are you servicing a whiteboard? Mm, pretty much. <laughs> Horrible thing. Well, I hope you started at the offside and finished on the near side. <laughs> I don't know by this point. <laughs> I, t I take it you sorted out all the registration numbers for the sales cars and the rentals. I did, yes, they are all printed out over there. Yeah, well, I'll leave you to it, I'm not getting involved. But there's your car keys. Thank I've, you. I've done your tyre pressures. Thank you. So uh, you're all good to go now. By the way, oh, yeah. I've put another job for you. You're joking, aren't you? It's nearly time to go home, isn't it? Well, still got some time to do. Go on then, hit me with it. One of our drivers put a petrol in a diesel car. You what? One of our drivers put a petrol in a diesel car. Uh, it, what, a taxi? Yep. Oh, fan bloody tastic. Your Mondeo Mark IV is running on petrol. <laughs> you know what? You know what? This is, this is not an uncommon event. Although it hasn't happened for a little while, but we get quite a lot of this. We get drivers, they will put petrol, they will forget. They're, they're in la-la land, some of them. They're, they're sort of like, probably got their, their, their headphones on and listening to their, their reggae music or something. Can they, they go up to the petrol pump. Well, I'm not sure about this driver if he's <laughs> listening to the, well, you know. What, 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 what driver is it? Do you know what, who it is? Uh, I believe it's number 15. Number 15, well let me tell you something, number 15 is about, I'll, I'll give him a pass actually, this guy is about 80 years old, so if he's got confused on, on whether it's the green or the black one to put in his, his filler neck, <laughs> oh, dear. oh well, well. So, chop, chop. yeah well thank you for that, anyway, have a nice day Monty, by the way we've also got 37,000 subscribers now, Yeah, we're, 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 almost, we're almost at the silver play button. <laughs> Not. Any <laughs> <laughs> anyway, see you later. See you later. Bye. Bye. And that little spanner light that's showing, that's because it's reading low fuel pressure. Because obviously the petrol doesn't give the same pressure as what the, the diesel oil does. When I rev that a little bit, that will eventually go out. But obviously that spanner light shouldn't be on to start with anyway but yeah if you've only put like five as worth maybe a ten as worth of, of petrol in a diesel car don't worry too much the best thing to do rather than trying to drain it out is to put another 20 30 pounds worth of diesel in and that'll water the petrol down and then everything will be okay again yeah here we go <laughs> oh my god this is quite common event here I've, I've decided to take the uh, the fuel filter out. I'm going to change the fuel filter, but yeah, yeah, that's petrol. <laughs> that that is petrol. Oh dear, oh dear. You can I can smell it. It's so pungent. So yeah, what I'll do. Luckily. There's only a little bit, he's only put like a five or a tenner's worth in there now. So what I could possibly do, rather than trying to drain it all out, I can just fill the car up with diesel and it'll water it down and it won't be so bad.
but as I noticed on this I won't switch the ignition on because otherwise fuel is going to split out them pipes but when I put the ignition on the spanner light come up and it's coming up low fuel pressure it's obviously because there's petrol in there fuel pipes rather than diesel it's not reading the right pressure so uh, I'll change this filter then get this down the petrol station fill it up with diesel and that'll water the petrol down and that'll be job done if there was obviously far too if it, if it had filled this up with or put more than half a tank of petrol in this then I'd have to drain it out but because there's only sort of like from what I can see on the fuel gauge there's only probably about five or five or ten or at the most fuel in here put more diesel in and just water it down and that'll be job done anyway that's it so thanks for watching guys see you in the next one adios